Before this episode starts, I'd like to tell you about a book giveaway. It's the amazing story of a US 23-year-old who smuggled the music of the Soviet underground to the West in order to produce the groundbreaking album Red Wave for underground bands from the USSR. For how to be in with a chance to win the book, check out details in the show notes of every Cold War Conversations episode. Now, back to this episode. You know, a couple minutes and she called and called back and said, no, your visa is declined. And, you know, I don't really remember much after that. I remember just feeling like my whole life was pulled out from under me. You know, anything that meant to me in that moment was all in Leningrad. This is Cold War Conversations. Thanks to Patreon Simon Smith for today's intro. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. This is the final part of our chat with Joanna Stingray, who was only 23 years old when she first set foot in the Soviet Union and started meeting now legendary musicians and artists of the Soviet underground. By 1985, she was writing and recording with them and smuggling their music to the West in order to produce the groundbreaking album Red Wave, four underground bands from the USSR. In this part, we hear about Joanna's heartbreak when her visa is refused, preventing her from marrying Yuri. However, using an ingenious method, she manages an emotional reunion and eventual marriage as the Soviet Union begins to dissolve. Joanna's book, Red Wave, written by her singer-songwriter daughter Madison, includes Stingray's extensive collection of photographs, artworks and interviews with the musicians. There's links in the episode notes. If you're enjoying the podcasts, I would really appreciate your donations to support my work and enable me to continue producing it. If you become a monthly supporter via Patreon, you will get the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Still not sure? Here's one of our financial supporters. I'm Tim from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I support the Cold War Conversations podcast financially because of the great research and the quality of the storytelling. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. So, back to today's episode. I'm delighted to welcome Joanna Stingray to our Cold War Conversation. Not for a second in my mind was I worried anymore about my visa. I had become above ground. I was in the middle of multiple projects with the official Soviet organizations. So all was good and and for the first time had no fear. Lo and behold, everything falls apart because if the Soviet Union is anything, it's unpredictable. And a few days before the wedding, the travel agent called and said, we were supposed to get 30 visas. We only got 29. Yours was declined. And at first I almost started laughing because I, I just couldn't comprehend that that could be a reality. And when she didn't react and there was silence, I understood that this was serious. Um, she, she said, maybe it's a bureaucratic thing. Let me check. So I kind of held my breath to give it a you know, a couple minutes and she called and called back and said, no, uh, it, it, your visa is declined. And, you know, I don't really remember much after that. I remember just feeling like my whole life was pulled out from under me. You know, anything that meant to me in that moment was all in Leningrad. So that was the beginning of an arduous and difficult um, six, seven months of not being allowed to get back into Russia. And my parents, uh, you know, uh, got into their fixing mode and reached out to important politicians that they were friends with and, and other people, whatever avenues they could find to try to help. And, you know, I emailed 
uh, or sent telexes. There was no email at that time. I sent telexes to all of the Soviet counterparts that I was working with on all these projects and was met with silence. It was as if I didn't exist anymore. And every day that I wouldn't hear back from people or that they wouldn't answer their phones and I, I just couldn't get through and couldn't talk to Yuri or my friends, you know, became more and more difficult. I, I literally was distraught. It was just an awful, awful period in my life. Um, again, my, my parents were using all their efforts to try to get something done. And there were a couple of uh, senators, councilmen from California that sent telexes off to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to the Ministry of Culture, to the different people I was working with in Russia. And even they were met with silence. So when they put up a wall and treat you as a ghost, it's, it's full force. Um, so it, it really just seemed like it wasn't getting anywhere. At one point, my mother even said, you know, at some point, Joanna, maybe you're going to have to give this up and try to make a life here and focus. And I completely flipped out screaming and crying, saying I'd rather be in a Russian jail than sitting there in her big Beverly Hills house. You know, it just, it was just devastating. I, I just, I, I couldn't imagine uh, a life without these people and without everything that was there that meant so much to me. Um, my biggest champion was Senator Alan Cranston, which was one of the senators of California. And he, from the very beginning said, this is nothing more then when two people are in love, you never keep them apart. He didn't care of the circumstance. He didn't care what I was doing in Russia. He just was focused on you never keep two people in love apart. So he had, you know, endless energy to try to help my cause and tried to telex and uh, the Soviets with no response. He also focused on trying to get it higher up the political change, uh, the, the political chain uh, in the U.S. And at some point, he got his message through or met with um, Secretary of State George Schultz and told him that this is not OK. Um, I, I didn't know that. He was in the background trying to do his stuff. And I was just trying to somehow keep a connection with my Russian friends. I um some of, some of how I found to do that is I would be listening to their songs a lot. And sometimes I would just hear my own lyrics, English lyrics to some of their songs. So I would go in the studio and re-record uh, 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 my English version to some of Victor Tsoi's songs, Boris's songs, Elisa's songs, Strange Game songs. And that at least made me feel in some energetic way that I was connected to them, that now I, I had my songs that were their music with my lyrics. And I just did what I could to get myself out of bed and to try to keep some hope that I would get back to where I wanted to be. Um, when it got to the point where it looked like it was just never going to be able to, to, to happen, so this is about the end of June and, and really just being in a really depressed state. Somehow somebody gave me some information that there was a way to go into Leningrad from uh, Finland, from a night boat from Helsinki and then tour Leningrad for seven hours. And the most important thing about this tour is that you did not need to send them a copy of your passport with your photo and all your information. Before this, my parents were in Europe and they would go to, to Soviet consulate in different countries trying to get me visas places and they were just declined left and right. So this seemed like a glimpse, a glimmer of hope that maybe there's somehow I could do this. So I quickly, through friends of my parents that can make it happen in a day, changed my name legally to Stingray. Um, the Russian fans of these rock bands after the Red Wave album came out and uh, everybody knew my nickname and my code name uh, for the album was Stingray. The fans in Russia started calling me Stingray and even some of my Russian friends would call me Stingray. Stingray. So I quickly changed my name legally to Joanna Stingray and quickly, within a day or two, got a new passport. So I had a new passport number. The only thing you had to do to get on this tour from Finland 
was to email your passport number and fill out an application. Um, so I did. And theoretically, they said, yes, I could go on this trip. So I, I couldn't believe that there was a chance maybe I could get back. I understood that I couldn't convey this to any of my Russian friends. It was very difficult to communicate with them, but I could get messages in through the Swedish consulate. My sister went to Russia once or twice while my visa was declined. But I realized the only way that this might be able to work is to not tell anybody and just go and try to get in. So we planned it that my sister would be in Leningrad at that time. And she would tell them that morning that supposedly I was coming in on this boat for seven hours. And um, I I was excited that there was at least some some chance to try to get in. My mother, when she heard about this, said, no, no, no. You can't go do this. It's too dangerous. They, they, you're an enemy of the state, and you could get arrested. Um, she very quickly understood that I was not going to back down. That I had to try to do whatever I could to get in. So she decided she was going to go with me. And I said, "Mom, mom, I don't. I, you don't have to go with me." And she said, "No, no, no. If you're going, if there's going to be danger, I'm going to be there with you." And knowing my mother, how I knew her, I knew she was was not going to back down and, and was going to be very adamant that she had to go. So I kind of let it be. We go to Helsinki. Um, Mom goes into the travel agency to get our visas. We had a producer and a cameraman from NBC that wanted to be with us, at least in the Finland part. They originally wanted to um, film the wedding, which was canceled. So you see the guy just on my small video camera. They didn't bring any professional large cameras. And you see him filming my mom. And my mom, of course, uh, says, oh, okay, you have our two visas. You know, we have two friends with us. Is there any chance uh, that we could possibly get two more spots? And miraculously, my mother got two spots. So the producer and the cameraman got to go with us. We go in the afternoon and we get on this boat and we go into our rooms and we realize right away that this boat is filled with Finnish people. And once the boat leaves and it's in the water, we hear this music and we hear all this, you know, noise and partying going on. And we realize that this trip is more about Finnish people having a night of fun and partying because the alcohol in Finland was very expensive. But the minute that the boat left Finnish shores and was in the ocean, it was half price or some ridiculously low price that they kind of made it into a party boat. And it was much more about them being on this boat and having getting drunk all night than actually going into Leningrad. Um, for us, of course, it was all about getting into Leningrad. And as I'm in my room with my mother, I she starts fussing with my hair. And I said, Mom, what are you doing? She says, you know, we really have to try to disguise you a little bit. I had this two-toned hair, blonde on the top, brown in the middle, and blonde underneath. It was very obvious. Um, it was a strange hairstyle. I, for some reason at the time thought it was very cool. Um, and my mother's trying to mess it up and it was my look and I loved it. So I didn't want her to, but in the end I've kind of compromised and said, okay, you know, I'll just, I'll put one of my, you know, bandanas or ribbons I used to wear in my hair and I'll, and I'll, I'll put it kind of up in a bun. So it's not hanging down and back. And that was the compromise to try to get in. And then I do remember we had discussions with the NBC people about what the plan was. And uh, the plan with Judy was that we were going to meet at Boris's flat. If I could get in, that's where we would meet everybody. And so it was a process of telling the NBC uh, people and my mother Boris's address and that they had to remember it because we didn't want to have the address written on them in case they got, you know, checked it at customs. Um, and then, you know, I was just so giddy that I was, you know, on this boat, you know, in the water, feeling like I'm edging towards Leningrad. You know, I just was so revved up to a point that my mother had to give me a part of a sleeping pill to get to sleep. I just couldn't calm down. I was out of my mind with excitement. The next thing I know is that the boat is moving very slowly and peacefully, and I could see rays of light coming through the um, window treatments. And I wake up, and it's very early in the morning. It might be about 5 in the morning. Of course, uh, this is during the white nights where it's hardly dark in Russia. And I wake up, and my mother wakes up, and we go on the top deck of the boat, 
And all I remember is the boat is gliding through this calm crystal uh, water. I don't know if it's crystal, but the boat is, is gliding through this completely calm water. And we're going, uh, we're outside the sea, I don't know how far, but on the sides are all of these boats that look dilapidated and falling apart and rusty. And there's, you know, Russian letters on the side of these boats. And I just remember this overwhelming feeling of happiness that I was home. And it's interesting because every time I ever go back to Leningrad and step on that ground, I feel like I'm home. It's as if I was there in an earlier life. There's just something about that city that resonates with my energy. But the boat is coming in and I am just, tears are flowing down my face because I'm back to where I'm supposed to be. We pull up and by that time, the two NBC people had come up with us and we're all looking down at uh, where we're coming into this little port. And there's a huge, big concrete building um, that we see. And that's where you're going to go through customs. And then you can see on the other side of it, this huge square. And the, and at the end of the square is the street with the cars. So I realized by looking down at this, that, okay, this is my plan. I need to somehow get through the customs. And then I need to get through this square where all the buses were waiting for all of us to get on and do our seven hours of touring. But my goal was somehow to just walk through this square and get into Leningrad and get to Boris's. So we pull up and the Finnish people, the tourists are nowhere to be seen. And I run down to the floor, a couple floors down where they're starting to put, connect the bridge up where we can get off. And we're the only people standing there. And the NBC lady says, you guys, don't you think we should back up a little bit and wait till some of the Finnish tourists come down so it's not so obvious we're the only ones here? And as she's saying that, they hook the bridge up, they open uh, you know, the path, and I am gone. It's as if there was nobody in the world but me and my mission. And I go running in. I go quickly walking once I got into the customs thing. I remember, don't, don't run, don't run, don't act too excited. But I'm walking very quickly and I get inside and I don't take anything with me. I'd given everything to my mother. So I had no bags. I didn't have to stop to get my bags checked. It was just me and my passport. So I walk through and go straight to the passport control. I, I hand my passport to the gentleman and he's doing his thing and he's looking at the passport. And he's looking up because there's a mirror up behind me. So he's looking at the mirror to check. Do I seem to have anything in my back pockets or whatever they're doing with this mirror? And then he starts going through the pages of my passport. And I start to shake a little bit because I realize, because I have a new passport, that there are no stamps except for the one stamp I got the day before from going into Finland. And I thought, oh my gosh, maybe this is a red flag. that It's a brand new passport. I wonder if this is going to, you know, cause any alarm and he's looking at it and he seems to pause as if he's thinking and the next thing I know I hear this huge thud and ah this scream and the guy and I turn and we see my mother has come into the building and she has fallen on the ground or flung herself as I come to know later on the ground and drops her huge Louis Vuitton bag that has all of these things rolling out of it that you would bring in that Russians would love or you could sell on the black market. There's lipstick, there's perfume, there's cigarettes. There's all these packets of soy sauce she was bringing in for Victor Soy, and there's gum and it's all rolling on the floor and all of the guards start running over to her and the passport control guy is looking over there confused and the next thing I know I hear this and I look back at him and he hands me my passport I can't believe it so my thoughts of my mother and if she's okay have disappeared from my mind and I just face that door on a mission get through uh, get through the square get through the square I walk out. I'm the only one there except for about eight buses lined up. 
and the bus drivers, some of them out of their buses smoking cigarettes. And I refuse to even look at them. I have now taken on the, if I don't see them, they're not there attitude that the Russians had. I walk and I make sure with my rushed breathing that I try to slow my pace down that I don't look like I'm running. Just be calm, keep going, keep going. My face, my eyes are focused straight. I'm afraid to move. And as I'm walking through the square, I'm so tense because I'm just waiting for something to happen that somebody's going to scream, Hey, you know, as if what I'm doing or, or, and then I started to feel that I was almost in one of these films where, where the silence is so thick that you're just waiting for it to be shattered by a gunshot or by people yelling and running. I mean, it just seemed like a, a scene out of a movie And the next thing I know, it felt like I was on a treadmill, that I was just never getting to the end, that I was walking but not getting anywhere. And the next thing I know, I'm at the street. And I I put my hand out, um, down a little bit, which is how you kind of uh, hitchhike, so to say, in those days in Russia. You would put your hand down and wave it a little and people then would stop and see where you wanted to go and decide if they wanted to take you. And then you'd give them a little money at the end. And the next thing you know, I'm standing, I put my hand down and this car pulls right up to me and stops as if it was scheduled to pick me up. You know, it was so surreal. And I was kind of, you know, in a dreamlike state. And I opened the door and sat down and told them Sofia Karovskaya, which is Boris's street, And off he goes. And here I am in this Russian car with the Russian smells. And I am just beaming. I I am home. And I'm anticipating, you know, seeing my fiance, who I love, Yuri, and and seeing Boris and seeing Victor. And I it was just the happiest, you know, 10-minute ride of my life. And just being back and seeing the Russian buildings and even seeing things that you know, weren't nice, you know, building crumbling or, you know, people smoking on the street. And I hated all those people smoking. Suddenly all of that to me uh, was just joyful and happiness. And the next thing I know, he drops me off at the top of the street and I'm walking down the street. And the next thing I know, (laughs) there's Yuri and we're running towards each other and we just embraced. And the first thing I noticed was that his long hair that he had this thick, gorgeous, long hair was all caught up, cut up. His hair was all cut off and his head, you know, shaved down, you know, to just a quarter of an inch of his hair. And I just looked at him, your hair, but he's kissing me and I'm kissing him. And then my sister runs up and she's hugging us. And it was just such, a, you know, it's just such an incredible moment that, I had really gotten to the point that I thought it never was going to happen. And I was afraid to admit the defeat that I was never going to get back there. And then it seemed like in a moment I was back there. Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, that that's an incredible story. And it sounds like your mum put on an Oscar winning performance there at customs. You know, she did. And it's funny because my mother, who was a very famous dancer and a rock head and was on the Jackie Gleason TV show as one of his dancers, actually was in one film, a very famous film, Marilyn Monroe's Some Like It Hot. My mother was one of the girls in the band. So she acted in that film and would probably was going to continue an acting career, but she got pregnant with my older sister. So yes, my mother used whatever acting training she had <laughs> and and did did an amazing job of getting me back in. It was unbelievable. So how, how long did it take your mom and the uh, the TV crew to show up? So the TV crew, the two people showed up without my mom not long after I got there. And of course, were completely not happy that they missed the reunion. I guess I had agreed the day before to wait for them. I don't really remember that. Um, As if that was going to happen. I know, exactly. So they did have us kind of reenacted again. So I do have it on video and it was just as good reenacting it because I I just, again, because it didn't seem real. So when they said do it again and, you know, I came around the corner and saw Yuri, I actually was just as excited. You know, it's as if the dream has that loop in it and it's reoccurring. 
So we ended up up at Boris's um, communal flat back in that kitchen that I had spent so much time. Uh, Boris was not there. He was coming back from the dacha, uh, a dacha. So we were going to see him in the afternoon. But very near after that, Victor Troy ran up and saw me and I was so thrilled. And we were upstairs and then Gustav, the drummer from Kino, came and Tumor Novikov also came. So a bunch of us were up in the kitchen just just beaming at each other and just hugging each other and having fun. Um, at some point, I guess my sister and Seva, who was there, decided to go and buy some food or some drinks. So uh, my sister went down the eight flights of stairs at Boris's. And as she got down to go out the door, my mother walked in. So my mother miraculously, not knowing any Russian, never having been to Russia, has no money, no Russian money, but she does, I guess, have all these things, whatever the customs let her keep. They did take some of the things away, of course. Uh, managed to find her way to Boris's apartment. And my sister, seeing my mother, says, Mom, what are you doing here? <laughs> and my mom's thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, I've just done this huge thing and this huge beat. My daughter's like, what are you doing here? So my mother gets there and comes upstairs and... I give her a big hug and all of my friends begin to hug her. And my mother has never met any of them. She knows them all from me putting out the Red Wave album, from making the music videos, obviously from me, you know, showing her photos of Yuri and who I'm going to marry. But it was a great moment of my mother just giving them all big hugs. And then we just all sat there and had tea, which is what you do in Russia. And uh, NBC, of course, wanted right away to ask questions. Alex Khan had shown up. And the funniest uh, part of the day probably is the NBC woman trying to email, a uh, the NBC woman trying to interview Yuri. And of course, I knew Yuri, um, even though we didn't speak each other's language that well, I obviously knew who he was and his personality. And Yuri was a man of very few words. And you couldn't get Yuri to do something that wasn't natural for him. You know, he's not going to play along or do some kind of game. And it was so funny because she's interviewing him and he's sitting on a chair and I'm sitting in between him and he has his arms around me and Alex Khan is translating and she's trying to do what journalists do. And she's trying to get the emotion and maybe for him to tear up. And she's saying, you know, how does it feel to have Joanna back and to have her in your arms? Good. He says, and she says, well, um, why, why do you think, you know, the Soviets are keeping you guys apart? I don't know. Um, well, why do you think the Soviets should allow you to get married? You know, if they don't think you should, why do you think they should allow it? And he says, why not? <laughs> and it was so eerie and it was so funny that you could see her frustration at not getting what, what she wanted to get from it. And, um, she keeps trying and trying and finally towards the end of the I think my sister says, Yuri, Yuri, you know, tell her you love her or something. And then Yuri, you know, look, grabs me and says, of course, I love Joanna very much. And, and then we laugh and kiss. So at least she got that, but she, she, she didn't know what she was up against. You know, um, Russians, you know, were not Americans that knew, that when you're interviewed, you know what the interviewer wants, so you play into it. But that that wasn't part of, you know, Russian life at all. And it, it wasn't anything Yuri understood or would have done anyway. So that that was a very um, cute moment. And then we also um, had my sister film us uh, singing to play back on my Walkman of a song, Feeling, that I had written with Sergei Kurokin that I had written a line for all of my friends there. Boris sang a line, Soy sang a line, um, and Vita Salagup sang a line, and then Sergei Kurokin sang. And we had recorded that in Russia, and then I mastered it in the States. So we recorded us singing it back so I could make a music video of it when I got home. So we did that because that was part of our life, was always our creativity and our art and our music. And then, of course, we went up, on Boris's roof, which we spent so much time because I had come with a bunch of these clip watches uh, that they wanted to give me for all of my Russian friends to get photos for them to use. I, I'd gotten lots of things 
from the um, rock magazines in the States would give me t-shirts and all kinds of things to give the Russian rockers. And then we would take photos to then give back to them. So we're up on the roof talking and taking photos with these swatch watches that kind of became a sponsor. And, um, you know, it was an amazing day. And I, I felt so in the place I was supposed to be that I questioned if I shouldn't just stay and not go back on the ship. I couldn't believe I was going to have to leave in a few hours. But Alex Kahn and everybody agreed that if I didn't leave, then I was actually doing something illegal. And then they had a right to never, ever give me a visa. So at the end of the day, we we started walking back towards the boat and we had a meeting place where we met Boris. And it was just so amazing to just embrace him again and, and the spiritual energy that he had that always calmed me down. I could feel it going through my body. And, you know, it just all felt right. And so it was hard to muster up the courage to leave. But at least this time when I left, I I looked them each in the eye and I took a moment to have this real connection with them that if it was going to take, you know, another six or seven months to get back, this time it would be okay because I, I just had the special moments with each one of them before I left. If you're listening this far, I know that you are enjoying the content and I could use your support to help me to find the time to continue to capture these amazing stories and preserve them. If you'd like to support me with this project, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate and check out the options. Now back to today's episode. What I didn't know at the time is either right when I was there in Russia or maybe a couple days after is that there was a meeting between secretary of state, George Shultz with the Soviet counterpart, uh, Nazi. And at this meeting where they were going over plans for Gorbachev and Reagan to meet again, Shultz brought up about my blocked marriage. And he said, how can Gorbachev supposedly, this is what Senator Cranston had said to him, how can Gorbachev and his rhetoric of glass and open and glass notes and openness and a real change in Russia, how can he be saying that to the United States where his actions are showing otherwise? So after I got back from getting in on that seven hours, literally, I think within a week, uh, I had gotten a visa approved. I was trying to get visas every couple of weeks and all of a sudden my visa was approved and I got my life back. To get married in Russia, you couldn't just get married. You had to go to one of these special official wedding uh, palaces and you had to register. And when you registered to get married, they would give you a day three months later. So Yuri and I went and miraculously registered to get married again. And again, what that proved is that nothing was, was all on the same page in Russia. You know, I could have my visa decline and that could have been by the KGB or somebody in Moscow, but it didn't trickle down to the wedding palaces in Leningrad. So they didn't know I was an enemy of the state. I happened to be there. I showed them my new passport number and they registered me. So we did register to get married again. And our new date was November 2nd. So um, when I got home and then got a visa a week later, I got back to Russia, I believe, right away in August. And then I went again, I think, in October before the wedding. But the minute that I got off the blocked wedding list, again, it felt like Russia had changed so much. It felt so much more open. The bands were doing more than they ever did before. They were playing huge stadiums. They all had managers for the first time. They were making money. You know, it really... Uh, changed so much in the seven months that I couldn't be there. Victor Tsoi uh, and Africa were in a movie also where Victor was at the closing scene that changed his whole career and catapulted him to being probably the most famous person in Russia uh, by the end of 1987. Um, So everything had changed so much and it was a little bit bittersweet. I was so happy to be back, but I had missed so much because what I had always seen in Russia is that you know, they were so used to hardship. So even though it affected them and made them sad when things happened, their life went on. There were still a bunch of 
amazing pop mechanic concerts that went on that I missed you know, things move forward and things happen. My life hadn't moved at all in seven months. Um, you know, it stopped in its tracks. So it was a little bittersweet to see how much I had missed. But of course, once I was back there and back in the arms of all of my friends, I was just part of it again and 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 happy, happy as could be. And and how was your 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 wedding day? How did that how did that go? You know, the wedding ended up becoming a very big thing in, in, in Russia. As Sasha Lipnitsky from the group Zvukimu wrote years later with some footage from the wedding, that it was kind of like their Camelot day, this big ro- Russian rock and roll wedding. And it was kind of the, the marking of the end of the Soviet era, that it, it, it was on a new path and a new road. And the day of the wedding was, was amazing. I mean, Yuri and I, you know, woke up and we were giddy and we were um, getting ready to go to the the wedding palace. And of course, I had this white wedding dress that was designed that my mother had a designer make for me. And it was kind of um, futuristic with, with these big shoulders and things. I never, ever wore dresses. That was not my thing. I certainly never, ever wore white. But when my mother was pushing me, you know, this is, you get married once. It's such a tradition. Why don't you do it? I actually realized, you know, I will do it. So she helped to have um, a designer, uh, you know, go over it with me to figure out my way. So it was kind of a little rockerish. Um, but I remember um, thinking, you know, I'm not going to get in it now. Let's go to the wedding palace. And after they do my makeup and everything's ready, I'll get ready there. For me, it was still the least amount of time I could be in a dress and heels, the better for me. Anyway, we go to the wedding palace and there's these beautiful rooms with these high ceilings and all of this wonderful, you know, architecture and design. And they take us to one of the rooms where we're supposed to sit to wait and get ready. And there are all of these kind of cabinets with glass doors that have historical garments and and items, even from the czarist days, which is amazing. And at one point, Yuri and Victor walked me over to a window and they said, see that that little, like a tiny little cottage there? That is the first house in Leningrad that was Peter the Great's. So there was all this history around and it just, you know, it, it was, it just, felt so interesting and amazing. And um, I finally go and put my dress on and I have these white satin pumps with high high heels that I come out and Yuri and Gustav and Victor, their mouths just dropped. They'd never seen me anything, me in anything like that. And they were just flabbergasted. And, you know, we would just, we were sitting there for a long time. We had to wait for all the guests to come in the other room. Yuri kept running in and out of the other room, just beaming, you know, meeting all of his friends and and being with my parents. My parents were there. My sister was there when my friends was there. Um, And then we had the ceremony. And, you know, it's all very official how these weddings are run in in Russia. They're all uh, very similar. And so I remember um, our best man and best woman in Russia. It's kind of your um, I forgot what it's called in Russia. They they sign for you. Um, Yuri had picked Victor and I initially wanted to pick Boris, but, um, Yuri said it's traditionally a woman. And because Victor was his, that I should do his wife, Mariana, which was fine. I was very close to Mariana. So they were kind of, uh, like our, our, our official, um, best man and best woman. And we walk out there to this music and Yuri's holding my arm in a certain way. And all our family and friends are sitting there and, Yuri is guiding me with my arm because I guess there's some way specifically you have to stand on the carpet. There were two different designs on the carpet. And I guess you stand right in the middle. So I'm on one side and he's on the other. And for me, it was kind of a blur, uh, all of it going on. And this woman then starts speaking and I can't understand a word she's saying. So I'm just standing there smiling. And this woman in this long red dress and this big necklace starts officiating and saying whatever she was saying. It was all in Russian. I couldn't understand one word. So here I am at my wedding, standing there thinking, I wonder what she's saying. I wonder if it's interesting. I wonder what's going on. And I'm just sitting there. And then Yuri starts kind of looking at me, turning to me a little bit and beaming as if, isn't that great? Isn't, this is, you know, this is the important part. And I, I don't know what's going on. 
So at some point she stops talking and it's completely silent. And I'm just sitting there smiling and Yuri's turning his head and looking at me. And I look up at Yuri and he's looking at me and I didn't know what was going on. And all of a sudden it hit me and I just said, duh, which means yes. And everybody starts laughing because it was obvious. I didn't understand what she was saying and, and that she was saying the part about, do you take Yuri? And, and so then she continues speaking. Yuri says it. And then she's speaking, and again, I don't know what's going on. And then she invites us to go up and sit at this table and sign this huge book that has all of this written stuff. Again, I don't know what it says. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm signing. I don't know what I'm signing, but this is what I'm supposed to do. And, you know, again, when you're in love, you don't care. I sign it. Yuri signs it. Victor and Mariana are invited up to, to sign it to be our witnesses. That's what they were, our witnesses. And then we go back and she's speaking again. And then she's speaking to our parents who are sitting there. And it's all very grand and serious, but I'm really clueless to all of it. And then all of a sudden, I guess she said, you're married, you can kiss the bride because Yuri just grabbed me after we had first put the rings on each other's fingers. And then Yuri grabs me and they all start screaming. I heard Africa, opa and hurrah, which is hooray. And the music's blasting. And, you know, we were married. So in some sense, I felt like it was a dream as if I wasn't really there. I can't really remember specifically being there. It was just this, you know, intense euphoria um, that I remember about, about that whole ceremony. And of course, after part of the tradition is getting in a Russian limousine called the Chaika, which I got in with Yuri and Victor and Mariana. And then all our guests got in a bus and you go to these specific spots around the city of Leningrad and do things. And we went to the river Neva and you, you know, touch your hand in the water. And then we went um, to another a famous square with a statue of Peter the Great and you lay one flower down. And, and so we went around the city. Now at this time it, it got a little bit cloudy and, and cold. And I remember, you know, being a little bit cold when we first went out. But, um, you know, the alcohol came out and I don't like the taste of alcohol. So they all knew I don't really drink alcohol. But by the first stop we were on the Neva, of course, it's my wedding. I would take, you know, a sip of the champagne. I would take a shot of the vodka. By the time we were at the third place where it was really cold because the sun was going down, I wasn't cold at all. And it finally hit me. And I thought, oh, my gosh, no wonder they're all taking shots of vodka. <laughs> It really is the panacea. And then the last thing is, the last thing you do is there's a place where the Cheki you're in uh, drives around in a circle. And you're supposed to be kissing your new husband or wife and continue kissing to see how many times you can go around this ring. And we're so drunk by this time and we're trying to kiss and it's going around and around. It sounds like you had such a good time that uh, I, can, I can forgive you for not remembering uh, all, all the details. That's painted a, a fantastic image there. How, how did the bands and your friends fare through Perestroika and the end of the Soviet Union? You know, again, from the time that Red Wave came out and now through some people that did PhDs on the Russian rock in the 80s, it's clear that the existence of Red Wave and the press it created in the West did have some effect of bringing the bands from underground above board and the Soviets very quickly rushing uh, to get it all above board to say that it was all a lie. Supposedly, the Red Wave album was handed to Gorbachev by somebody from the from the publishing agency and that he looked uh, throughout the double cover and the photos and that his response was, how can these bands be put out in the West and not here? And that opened the floodgates uh, to the Russian realizing, okay, we can let this all come above board. So by the time that Yuri and I got married, their lives had changed for the better, meaning they could do everything they wanted to do without any censorship. They could be in complete control of their art, but they now could have albums released on Melodia. They could be asked to perform in huge halls. Now, there were some underlying problems. I remember that Boris and his band Aquarium, uh, it was a very big deal, got to play three sold-out concerts at Jubilee, the huge concert hall in Leningrad. 
But what really pissed off Boris is that the equipment that they were supplied to play on was the crappiest equipment. And UB40 had had played like the year before and, you know, of course, brought in their amazing high quality equipment. So Boris now knew what it could sound like. And I remember interviewing him after that saying, well, was that all the equipment they had? And they said, no, it's the people at Goss concert. They don't care. You know, they don't give a shit is what he said. And they don't have to give us their better equipment. They know that they're going to get their money because the concerts are sold out. So we have to play on this crap. So again, they, they were on the one hand being allowed to do whatever they want, being in control of it, but they still didn't get enough time being allowed to record at official studios where there was a good equipment. You know, there was still a lot of bureaucracy and going and things going on. Um, but basically by the time we got married, uh, Russia was in a very happy place. It was the height of Glasnost where there really was openness. But what didn't change yet was that water still cost nothing in your apartment. Energy cost nothing. The, the, the cost of life was still pennies, that everything was still taken care of. So the Russians, to me, seemed happiest during this period, that they, they got what they wanted where they could speak more freely and not be afraid on the streets to laugh and, and, and do what they wanted to, but that um, how they lived their life and what it cost stayed the same. Um, so, yeah, the, it, was, it, was, it was a very good time. So they they sort of had the best of both worlds at, at that. Correct, point. correct, um, absolutely. And and then later on, how, how you know how did the bands cope with you know the the fall of communism and the complete change in the economic system that that Russia was using? Right. So the the most exciting things for the bands in the late eighties is not only could they tour and play concerts all over Russia. They could now travel. All of the bands at some point went to Europe or played in Europe. They all came and visited the United States, and it was amazing. And as I had told all of the press when Red Wave came out, is that these bands did not want to leave Russia and live in the West. They wanted to come visit, but they knew that who they were as artists was because of the Russian soil of the Mother Earth in Russia. And it proved to be true that they didn't. They came out and visited, but they all went back. Um, so everything was good. Once the fall of communism came in the 90s, in the early 90s, again, it didn't really affect many of the bands because they, again, were so popular. Whatever they did, people loved to go to their concerts and buy their albums. The little bit of a change that came after the fall of communism was that for the first time, you could have independent record labels come up. So it wasn't all... Uh, the mon monopoly of Melodia. So uh, they had choices, which meant that then they could maybe make more money by going with the independent company. Uh, the independent company for the first time was putting out CDs instead of albums to, to come up to date with what was going on in the West. Um, you know, uh, the, w the main thing that happened before communism fell is that Victor Tsoi, after starring at the end of the film Asa, where it just catapulted him to complete stardom, he starred in a film made by a, a Kazakh director, Rashid Nugmanov. And the theme of this movie was kind of a contemporary theme about drug use. And it was filmed and made in a very kind of uh, independent cool way and it became the biggest film in Russia and just again Victor was already such a huge star I don't know how it could make him any bigger so by the end of the 80s Victor Tsoi was the biggest thing that that was around in Russia and and it was it was incredible to see this humble man that was like my best friend become so famous but still you know retain who he really was at his core he was just like every other person and I think that's why he resonated so much with the Russian people. Um, they just could feel something in him that they could identify with. So at the end of uh, the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, Victor came twice to the United States, once as my guest where we hung out in his long-held dream of wanting to go to Disneyland. We went to Disneyland. And then the second year, 
to the Sundance Film Festival, uh, the film that he was in, The Needle, was being screened there. So he came a second time. And after that screening, it was such a big success. He and Yuri played a couple songs um, uh, on guitars. You know, everybody, all these Hollywood producers and, and producers from around the world were swarming around them. And one of the people we met was a very big producer in Japan of rock and pop music there. So in the early, the first half of 1990, Victor and I were invited. We went to Japan because they wanted to meet with him about putting out his film there, putting out the Kino music and having Kino tour there. So by, by 1990, Kino and Boris from Aquarium both had prospects to do things in the West, Boris in America and uh, Victor starting in Japan. So that was the biggest change, I think, when communism fell. Of course, the tragedy was the loss of Victor at 28 years old uh, in August, uh, August 15th of 1990, where he tragically perished in a car crash uh, in a small village in Riga where he was spending the summer with his new love um, at a dacha. So, of course, that for me was devastating as it was for the, for the whole Russian population. It was just um, incomprehensible that, that this hero that everybody lived on his words could from one day to the next be gone. So that, that of course changed everything. Um, but I think as, as communism fell and as capitalism came in, and let me tell you that the early nineties in Russia was a, very strange place. It was kind of like the wild, wild west. People were obsessed with money, obsessed with with dollars and doing anything to get it. And, and they now had access to Western goods. And, and that's what it was all about. So it, 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 the atmosphere in, in the early 90s certainly wasn't, wasn't an interesting place to be. And I think by the late 90s, you know, Russians didn't really care anymore about rock music. There weren't any really new rock bands. You know, the famous rock bands from the eighties were still famous. So they could still always play. There were the, the other bands that came up in the rock club in the eighties, DDT and a bunch of others. So they maintained their popularity, but there wasn't any really new rock energy and young bands that came in. It more kind of all came to, to pop music. And then later this rap came into Russia by the late nineties. So that, that really special time that happened in Leningrad disappeared. And now that it's 30 years later, everybody realizes how iconic that period of the Leningrad rock club in the eighties was. It's very similar to how rock in the sixties in America was and in Laurel Canyon that you know, it's just it becomes a historic period that never goes away that people are nostalgic about and want to keep revisiting and doing films and documentaries and talking about it, listening to that music. That's how it is in Russia with the Leningrad rock. So the door really closed in the early 90s on that period, whether it was because of the fall of communism, whether it was because of just the natural, um, you know, period of, of that, that special thing just being over you know nobody knows why because you can never predict when you're going to have those those periods in art or in music that change everybody's lives it just it's something that happens you know the planets and the stars everything has to align and I was lucky enough and certainly grateful that I fell into it and was part of it there's further information such as photos and videos in our episode notes which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now this show wouldn't exist without our generous Patreons so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. You can very easily become a Patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.
Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.